So far, I've interviewed eight women from eight different countries to talk about perimenopause, making this my first interview with a Canadian expert on perimenopause and country number nine. Let me introduce you to Dina Bank. She is here to help all of us navigate through this transition with confidence, but most importantly, with knowledge. As a perimenopausal woman myself, I think it's crucial to have women with a solid knowledge on the subject on social media for us to follow. It's a lot easier to go through perimenopause when you have someone to reach out to when you're struggling with one, more than one, or all four perimenopausal symptoms. And Dina is definitely the person you need to have in your social media world. In this video, she talks about the statistics we hold for knowing very little when we go into perimenopause. She also talks about uh, doctors in Canada, how they're treating women, uh, the healthcare system in Canada for women, how Canadian men are dealing with our perimenopausal symptoms, the difference between body identical and bioidentical hormones, and a lot of other good stuff. So if you're ready to take charge of your perimenopausal journey and feel empowered and informed, this video is for you. Let's dive into it and meet Dinah. Hi there, my name is Dinah Vink, and I am an expert helping women through some of the challenging stages of, of perimenopause using a series of fairly natural and you know lifestyle oriented methods. Yeah, um, in 2018, the um, American Association of Retired Persons uh, did a study. And so first of all, they went to women and they asked women if they were satisfied with the treatment that they got from their doctors for their hormone related uh, issues. And 75% uh, of them said no, they were not satisfied. So that was pretty startling. Um, but then they went to the doctors and they said, uh, okay, doctors, it was the gynecologists, there were GPs and residents. So a variety of, of different doctors. And the doctors shockingly said 80% of them were not comfortable dealing with female hormonal issues. And so this was quite a revelation. And so, um, <laughs> uh they you know they said well why is that like what you know what what's the issue here and the the answer was pretty simple it was well uh we are not taught this in med school this is not part of the curriculum just like nutrition is not part of the curriculum you know they spend like 10 minutes on on nutrition in med school it's it's a pretty shocking thing for for women to you know to know is that their their hormonal health uh something that of course happens throughout their life from puberty until, you know, they roll into the grave, that that's a, a pretty important part of their health, but that doesn't appear to be part of the, of the medical curriculum. Well, perimenopause is that uh, that transition period before menopause. So menopause is when you've not had a period for a whole year. And perimenopause, it can be three years, it can be 15 years. So it's a pretty significant time frame uh, before actual menopause. And it's when all the confusion arises. So um, I actually just came across a, a, a study a, a couple of days ago which measured uh, the, the Canadian use of perimenopause and or understanding of perimenopause and menopause. And, and the distinction wasn't so great. Um, so I think it said 19% of women were uh, aware of what perimenopause was and about 24% were aware of what menopause was. So, you know, while they'd heard the term, they didn't really know what it was. Uh, so... <laughs> So th this this really does mirror uh, the the American situation quite closely. Um, uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are for the U.S., but uh, certainly on that awareness front, um, there you know the studies come up time and time again where you know 50, 60 percent of women had no idea what to expect for perimenopause or menopause. 
And it, it you know, it's somewhere between 50 and 70% uh, around the world. So it's a pretty significant number where women are really blindsided by some of these challenges that, that just roll into their lives. <laughs> In terms of um, what to do about uh, hormone, about, you know, treating perimenopause and menopause, uh, the, the numbers say that about 70% of women do nothing. And this is quite a, quite a concerning statistic because doing nothing can mean that these underlying conditions can gain traction. So osteoporosis, heart disease, dementia, right? These are, these are things that can be um, arrested. And then of course, there's the, the, uh, you know, the unpleasant circumstance of hot flashes, of night sweats, of joint pain, of brain fog, of all these other, you know, these symptoms, which uh, can really be supported if women do something uh, about their about their symptoms because women don't need to suffer right they they don't need to just tough it out and um, suck it up which is what what a lot of doctors uh, have said to women um well the women's health research has been underfunded uh forever <laughs> and uh only in the last mm, what is it 10 years um have uh women been required to be included in some of the the drug studies for example and that you can't just consider that women are smaller men you know uh they've got different metabolisms they've got different hormones uh they have different reactions they have different cycles and um, so, so there is certainly a, a change in that trend that's happening. But there are studies. Uh, studies have been done by different organizations for different things. So in the UK, there are, there's a, a task force that has done studies on perimenopause in the workplace, which is very interesting. And so, so there's some, you know, very interesting business cases that can be built on on uh, on that and developing um, uh, a menopause friendly workplace. Um, then there are the the menopause associations in different countries that have done a lot of research, and they have that's been pretty uh, pretty well funded and uh, some some very representative results. Uh, and then I'm sure that the HRT, you know, the the, manu the drug manufacturing companies have done some studies. I'm less familiar with those, um, but there, there certainly has been some research that has done. It's not like there's no research. Well, of course, drug plans cover it. You know, if you have a drug plan through your work uh, or if you have a private uh, health uh, insurance plan, it will cover it. Um, health care is just going through a period of change right now. Uh, so we have, of course, the, you know, the government health care, which is administered by the respective provinces in Canada. And they have uh, started uh, implementing certain uh, certain measures in order to ease the, the cost of drugs. But uh, birth control is just starting in a couple of provinces where uh, where different types of birth control is is covered. So that's uh, that's just starting. I imagine that over the next few years that will probably become more of a of a, of a national uh, availability. We're also um, on the cusp of um, well, on the cusp. I guess it's <laughs> ten years we've been on the cusp of. Um, of a pharmaceutical program across the country where you know some number of drugs will be covered free of charge and there's like a national purchasing and dispensing program so there's a huge amount of money saved in the procurement on on a large scale um, and then you know the different provinces would buy in uh, and uh, be able to distribute that that within you know within the respective provinces so of course it would fall under that too once once that was rolled out, but uh, it, that's not imminent. 
with when HRT came, I I had drug insurance, so so it was it was covered. You just pay the dispensing fee of five dollars or something. Um, but you know the the, the cost is um, yeah can be challenging certainly if if you're not um, if you're not you know fully employed or if there are you know, some people in your family who are not employed and you're responsible for for their uh, for their well being then then uh, certainly the cost of HRT could, could be an obstacle. I think uh, the Canadian and the American situation are very similar. Um, I think we're much more like the American situation in Canada than we are the the British situation. So one of the indicators here is uh, menopause friendly workplaces, and they have uh, done some studies, and it's you know it, it's not really all that definitive, but there are approximately three percent of workplaces that have got. Uh, uh, menopause policies in place. Uh, now, that's not to say, you know, with the with the federal government, they have a, a certain um, uh, accommodation policy that is uh, in in place, and that's meant to cover, you know, any kind of disability. Well, I'm not sure that menopause is a disability, <laughs> but if you require some accommodation, you can ask for it. Um, so that's, you know, that's the federal government, although it's not a menopause policy, there is an accommodation in it. So, um, it's, uh, it's not clear exactly how, how that's used for, for menopause because they're, they're not, you know, they're not measuring it. Um, but it, it certainly is a, a, a positive sign, you know, that, that women can ask for, uh, certain accommodations for, uh, you know, to accommodate their, their time at work. Um, but yeah, there, there are still, um, we still have a long way to go. My, my optimism is that the millennials now who are marching, you know, very firmly into this transitional period, perimenopause and menopause, they you know, they, they see that they have half their life ahead of them. And they're not satisfied to just sit and, you know, and, and struggle through challenging symptoms of some mysterious condition, right? Um, so the millennials are much more demanding. And so I'm quite optimistic that we are gonna see more changes, uh, both in Canada and the US in, in, the, in the coming few years. On the point of doctors, I just wanna mention about some uh, things that I see a lot. And that is when women go to their doctors, uh, their doctors have um, eyes for certain things that are that, that they can prescribe medication for. So some of the really common things would be sleep deprivation, right? So then, oh, I can give you something to make you sleep. Well, 80% of people, of older people, midlife people, who take sleep medication get side effects. So this is not good, right? Then um, another would be for um, uh, joint pain. So they can get medication for joint pain. And that is almost always, that, that can give uh, stomach problems and bloating. And, and so that's not a good thing. And so there are, and then of course we have the anxiety prescriptions, right? And it's uh, some kind of an antidepressant, which is um, a common thing that women complain about. They say, well, I'm just so down. I'm no energy and, you know, this isn't going well. And 40% of those uh, prescriptions deliver unwanted side effects. So, um, you know, going to the doctor is, has to be managed. <laughs> um, and all these prescriptions are given without ever discussing perimenopause or menopause. So, you know, what happens is that women are then struggling with the side effects on top of the symptoms that they're already dealing with. So um, in most cases, those prescriptions are, are, are not really helpful and um, can also cause them trouble, you know, extra, extra trouble. Okay, so let's explain the difference between bioidentical and body identical. Um, bioidentical hormones are a little more risky uh, because they are they are mixed by the pharmacist. And as your body, um, as you age, right, your hormones change over time. 
So uh, even as you progress through menopause, there can still be some change, but it's, you know, once you hit menopause, then that change will level off. So when you're having the, um, the bioidentical hormones, they are meant for you at a particular stage in your, in your, you know, movement through that cycle. So it's probably not a good idea to take the same uh, composition of, of mix of hormones um, over many years because your body will have changed. So I think that's the problem with bioidentical. Now, body identical is manufactured in a factory. So they're very strict regulations according to FDA standards uh, that, that, make, that, that mean that every batch that you get will be the same. So there's still some, you know, concern that you may need more or less. Uh, you know, if you're getting pumps of estrogen, for example, you may change, you may modulate those pumps over the period of your of your uh, perimenopause and into menopause. Um, and the, I, I recommend body identical because of the delivery mechanism. So first of all, it's reliable because of the the composition, right? There's not there's no mistake happening at the pharmacist level. Um, and secondly, uh, because of the delivery mechanism. So being uh, so delivering hormones through the skin is a much less dangerous uh, method than taking pills. So if you're taking pills, then it would have to go through your digestive system, through the liver, the, the kidneys, et cetera. And there could be some um, strain in, in coping with them. Whereas if uh, the estrogen and, and whatever else is in your HRT is absorbed through the skin, then you bypass all those complications. So uh, for long-term use, uh, using the, the patches and the gels is the, the best method of delivery over you know years and, and decades even. Um, HRT is good for for um, addressing certain symptoms. Hot flashes and night sweats are probably the the, the best ones. Some women also get some relief from um, uh, from kind of sexual dysfunction. So uh, pain during sex, for example, dry vagina, that kind of thing. It doesn't really help much with libido, which can also drop. And so for that, you would need more testosterone or for some women, estrogen cream applied locally can really help. Bladder changes and uh, urinary tract infections or UTIs are another common uh, side effect or you know, a symptom of perimenopause. And of course, it's precipitated by the drop in estrogen. So that's the starting point because estrogen is a protective uh, factor on on the um, on the resiliency of the bladder and the sling that it sits within. So um, there's a lot that you can do. Dairy can be a, a, can be an inflammatory item for the for the bladder, which is not good. But there are also certain very simple exercises that you can do, uh, which can really help to. Uh, to strengthen the bladder and to um, and to mitigate some of those urges. So sometimes you'll have these big urges, have to pee, have to pee, and then you you go to the bathroom and there's actually very little that comes. So then you think, okay, what was that all about? You know, um, and it's very common, very common to have that, or to wake up in the middle of the night and have to go to the bathroom right? That shouldn't be happening. Being able to identify when there's a problem that you can deal with is really helpful <laughs> in bringing about a, a, a more comfortable and, and vivacious lifestyle. Uh, I would say that men know less about perimenopause than women, but men see what's going on with their women and they think, okay, what, what is this? Um, and, you know, I've, I've uh, heard a number of things from the women I work with. Some of the, the uh, stories I hear are that men are very supportive and they're concerned when their loved one is going through this, you know, this destabilizing period in their lives. Uh, they, they see that, you know, the struggles that they go through and uh, they just want to help. 
So then they are asking, what should I do? And of course, a lot of women don't know what they can ask their men to, to do. Um, and then there are others um, who tell me that their husbands are not at all uh, supportive and they just want them to buck up and to, you know, quit being an idiot. And of course, that's, you know, that's really tough. But um, what I always recommend, and one of the things uh, that I include in my program is um, a document that helps women have the conversation with with their spouses, but, or it could be uh, even with children, <laughs> um, you know, with important people in their lives, and to try and explain what's going on in general, and then in particular, how it affects them, and uh, then to provide some things that they can do to help and to be sympathetic when something is going on and not to be accusatory as if women are intending to, you know, irritate them with this particular hot flash or, or night sweat or something like that. And to understand that, you know, nighttime temperatures being brought way down uh, is, is not to make them suffer, but it's because they're dealing with these hot flashes and night sweats that, you know, <laughs> that are causing a lot of distress. So when women uh, enter menopause, there are certainly some symptoms that will fall away and that will disappear, uh, but not all of them. So uh, there are quite a number of women. Uh, so as many as a third of the women, uh, once they go, get into menopause, still have hot flashes. So they're not as frequent or as, as intense as before, uh, but they still happen. Um, things like night sweats can still happen. Sleep disorders are things that will dog you. So if you don't figure out your sleep, don't think that it's going to get better in menopause because that is the biggest one that will that will hang on of all the symptoms. It's a matter of, I guess, having the tools to deal with what you're still being presented with. And of course, we can't predict, right? Everyone is a little different. And uh, everyone has different triggers for, you know, some things that may bring these symptoms on. So trying to understand what the triggers are and what the solutions are is is a big part of living, a you know, a, a, a full life. And, and for many women, there's still decades of life that are going to be happening. You know, the the average age uh, to reach menopause is 51. For me, it was 55. Um, <laughs> so I was a, a bit late on that front. And uh, there were still some symptoms that dogged me, even though I, you know, I was managing a lot of it, but uh, a lot of it did fall away. So there is hope. <laughs> and uh, a lot of women feel a resurgence of energy, which is fabulous. So if you've been really, you know, down in the dumps with, with low energy for the period of perimenopause, then there, there's certainly hope that there's, you know, that there's more energy on the other side. No, well, HRT is not a, a miracle cure. It, it can help, right? It can help with osteoporosis. It can help with heart disease. It can help against dementia. Um, and of course, it helps with hot flashes and with night sweats. But there, it, it, it won't do much for your digestion, it probably won't do a lot for your brain fog. Some women it helps, others it doesn't. It won't, um, well, some women feel that it helps with libido. Um, but there are a lot of things like with restless leg syndrome, uh, with um, depression, with anxiety that where, you know, it's not likely to to help. So while HRT is, is a, a good solution for many reasons, it's not a silver bullet. Well, with, with my approach, um, I'm happy to work with women who are already taking HRT, uh, but uh, that's understanding that HRT is not a silver bullet, right? There's still a number of, of symptoms that can uh, remain. Uh, so there may be some support. Uh, so for instance, hot flashes and night sweats tend to uh, improve with HRT, but there are still a host of other things that, that don't help, uh, that, that aren't helped. So with my approach, what I, uh, what I do, I'm not a doctor. Um, what I do is I use a series of natural approaches in order to work with lifestyle. 
And uh, there are a number of things that we can add to the lifestyle and some things that we take away from the lifestyle in order to make some, you know, some tweaks in in the end result that can make a huge difference for for women and how they feel. Um, so the, the first approach would have to do with food choices. And uh, so there are some foods that are inflammatory, and this can be particularly troublesome. It may not have been troublesome before, right? These are foods that perhaps women have eaten all their lives. And suddenly now, because of this, you know, change in the body, these foods are provoking problems and they're triggers. So uh, it's a matter of, you know, there are a number of foods that are commonly identified as being triggers. And so what we do is we recommend that that uh, that they get taken out of the diet for a while just to test to see what, you know, what what happens and uh, then to add other uh, call them nourishment. <laughs> so we're thinking about food now as nourishment rather than just something to eat. And uh, so understanding this this factor of what the body needs in this phase of life is is an important thing. Uh, the second thing we look at is sleep. So as I said before, one of the first things that you notice in perimenopause is this fatigue. And the fatigue is, uh, it's bone crushing, right? And, and um, of course, it's connected with uh, sleep disruption. So even though you may still be spending the same amount of time in bed, if you aren't having the kind of restorative sleep that you, you your body needs, then you're going to have some problems uh, in, in dealing with that in the morning. And, and poor sleep can bring things like um, cortisol. So it, it, it stresses your body when you don't have enough sleep. Your body hasn't done the overnight maintenance that it needs to do. And uh, the result is that your body is stressed. So uh, then what, what you need to do is to find a way to get more restorative sleep. And so that's something that we work with. The third area is we work with hormone appropriate movement. So when I said earlier about my my boot camp experience and how terrible that was, uh, that's you know that's again creating cortisol, that stress hormone that we that we don't want, you know, just in small amounts but not chronically. And so um, getting uh, both aerobic movement and uh, and resistance training is is really important. So then it's a matter of figuring out what are some things that that, uh, you know, that the that women like to do and that we can introduce into their lifestyle so that they they keep their muscles and they keep their bones strong, strong, because that's an imperative part to put osteoporosis in uh, in remission, right, is to build up that that strength muscle uh, tugging. And then, of course, aerobic ability is, is important just to get around. And then finally, we work with a positive mindset. So, so much of perimenopause and menopause is about anxiety and about, um, you know, depression or negative thoughts, right? So that that's a, a significantly important area that um, what we need to do is to give women the tools so that they can put themselves in a positive mindset and they can push the, the negative thoughts aside and not be, you know, brought down by them. So it's kind of the the icing on the cake, really, is to is to look at at that positive mindset on top of those other factors. So there's there's the food, there's sleep, there's uh, movement, and then we have the positive mindset. Those four areas is is where we spend our time. Inform yourself to know that you're not alone. To know that you're not crazy. Um, and that there's something that can be done. And of course, I'd be happy to, to guide you through that path.